difficult. Um, but we're going to get those worked out. We're going to need to load my sermon slides now, guys. <laughs> we're also a little short staff. Would you pray with me? Our God in heaven, we love you so much. And we again, I just continue in the spirit of worship, in the spirit of prayer as Mitch has led us and the worship team has led us in music. We just uh, continue to ask for your Holy Spirit to be with us. And God, that this would uh, just be another special moment that we have with you. Um, please may your voice be heard in this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. It looks like we're in, in shape here. Uh, I don't know how many brave souls we have here. How many of you were here last week? Five of you. <laughs> I think there were more than that. Um, I'm curious how many of you uh, spent any time reading Song of Solomon this last week. Did it perk your interest at all? Um, I mentioned that uh, kind of in the spirit of, of Valentine's and and. Uh, dovetailing in with the whole idea of love. I, I actually preached and, and we talked a little bit about that Old Testament book, Song of Solomon. And this is kind of a, a dovetail. It's not exactly the same, of course, but this is kind of a new direction um, building off of last week's sermon with the word love with a question mark. Love with a question mark. Now, don't misunderstand. I am not uh, going to delve into all the depths of the profound meanings of love and, and everything that can be said. This is going to be just an initial or a, a general overview of a principle um, of, of love that I think we can all benefit from. So I'm going to go ahead and um, get into my kids quiz. I know we don't have a whole lot of young people here. All right. Okay. So is that me? Okay. That was me. Thank you. Um, the, the quiz is just simply a fill in the blank. I'm going to give you some verses in the New Testament. They're all from the New Testament about love. And I want to see how many of our young people are familiar with these verses. Did Madden leave? Okay. Boy, I caught him uh, at just the time. Didn't mean to. So, um, you know, I know we only have so many young people here, so we're going to kind of be general about this. Uh, but if you'd like to participate, raise your hand. I appreciate Mitch bringing the mic around. Who knows this verse? The one who does not love does not know this, for God is love. If you don't know, if, if you don't love, then you don't know this. Can you fill in the blank? For God is love. What's, what's missing? The one who does not love does not know I actually put the Bible verse there so you can even look at it. This is an open book quiz. <laughs> this should, everyone should get 100% on this. Come on, anyone, raise your hand. Does not know. Are you raising your hand, Toby? All right. And I see you back there. Is that Harper back there? Oh, but you're behind the glass. But I, I'm so glad you're listening, Harper. Oh. <laughs> Were you able to get anything? Toby? They said God. Oh, is he right? He is right. The one who does not love doesn't know God, for God is love, right? Okay, that's a good one. Let's go to the next one. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of what? Every time we love, we are fulfilling what? Fulfilling the, Harper, oh, you brought Harper in. Harper, do you want to, do you know this one? Love. You are fulfilling, it starts with an L, and I like where you're going with this. Love is the fulfillment of the, law. Law, that is outstanding, thank you. Couple more, so you guys can hang out here. All right. Now, again, you more seasoned members, you're allowed. Vitor, I see you over here. Okay. You're not invisible. All right. Let's see. There's a couple more. By this, all men will know that you are my this, if you have love for one another. By this, all men will know that you are my what? Now, I hear whisperings out there. Raise your hand so Mitch can bring the mic. We want to be able to hear you. 
By this all men will know that you are my... Go ahead, go to Abel back. Or did I, am I missing someone? Because... Child. Okay, my child, kind of, sort of, maybe, a little bit. In the right area. Starts with a D. By this you will know, all men will know that you are my... I see Harper's hand again. Let's go to Harper. Disciple? Disciple. Yeah, you answered that like on Jeopardy. You put it in the form of a question. <laughs> disciple? <laughs> yes, you are my disciples. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Three things will last forever. This is from the great love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. I gave you two of them. Three of them will last forever. Faith, this, and love. But the greatest of these is love. What's missing there? These are the three things that are going to last forever. What's the one that's missing? I see Dylan's hand. Joy? Joy! No. <laughs> Faith, it starts with an H. Faith. Come on now. Adults, you can help because we only have so many young people. Oh, it's so intimidating. Hope. Abel helped us out. Faith, hope, and love. You've heard that before? Faith, hope, and love. And there's a lot of joy in that. I, I think that that is certainly true. All right. God demonstrates his own love towards us and th that while we were yet this, Christ died for us. What were we when Christ died for us? Americans? Republicans, <laughs> uh, 49er fans. Okay, Madden, Madden. Oh, let, let, let say it in the mic for us. Would you do that for us, Madden? Sinners. Sinners. Well, that's kind of synonymous with 49er fans. That's all right. Yeah. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I think that was the last one. Thank you, Mitch. I know we have a, a smaller group here today, but thank you for indulging in that. Uh, kind of beginning interactive time with the message. When Jesus came to this earth, he came to do many things, but fundamentally, it was a mission of love. Jesus is the personification of love. Everything that he did was in the context of love, demonstrating love, teaching love. It was a mission of love. He was the Redeemer, therefore we call him a Savior. That was an act of love. He came as a teacher, and he was called a rabbi, and he came to teach Love. He came to be the lamb and the sacrifice, all in the context of love. This was the core element that, that he did in a variety of ways. But every sermon he preached, every parable that he taught, every miracle that he did, every action he took was there to illustrate a lost reality that the community of faith had lost regarding what real love is. And even though the community that Jesus came to, the Jewish community, they knew the scriptures. I would hesitate to say, I wouldn't hesitate to say rather, they knew their Old Testament Bibles much better than most Christians today know their Old Testament Bibles. That was their, that was their focus as a community. They didn't have YouTube and they didn't have social media, uh, you know, and those types of distractions. As a community of faith, the Jews knew their Bibles. They memorized massive portions of Scripture. They knew the prophets. They knew the law. They were practicing the law. And yet, when the author of life, when the object of love came into their midst, despite the fact that they had the Scriptures, they had lost the focus so much, they had lost the perspective so much about who God was, that not only did they not accept Christ, they hated Him. Think about that for a moment. The, the, the object of love coming into the community of faith was so repulsive to the leaders and many who had lost perspective about who God was and, and what the Scriptures meant that when Jesus came into their midst, His light, His glory, His love was so uh, powerful that those who were not willing to accept it, those who had twisted it some way, could not accept Him and to the point that ultimately they would cry out for His death and send Him to the cross. So Jesus' mission was a mission of love. He was coming to reestablish a lost reality of what love, fundamental, profound love, is in the community of 
uh, the people of faith. And we should be uh, uh, we should learn a lesson from that. We may know the scriptures quite well. We may have been raised in church. We may be very comfortable and confident with our Bibles. And yet we need to be humble in the fact that there may come a time when we too have lost perspective. We've allowed culture. We've allowed the world. We've allowed distractions. We've allowed obstacles to twist the reality of who God is and what love really is in our context. So if, the, if, if other generations of believers, other generations of the sons, of his, sons and daughters of Israel and the followers of God have lost perspective, it is a time, it, it's just a warning to us that there are times we need to check ourselves as well. But notice these verses. Jesus says, I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. Jesus knew that even in my, oh, my voice just cracked there. Wow. Even amid, in the midst of his own people, those who had the scriptures, he said they are in darkness. They are in darkness, not because that the scriptures have been taken away like they were in the Middle Ages, in the Dark Ages, when, when literally people had no access to the Bible. Uh, they, they just It wasn't available. They had access to the scrolls. They had access to the scriptures, but they had lost the meaning of it, or it had been twisted, and as a result, they were in darkness. And Jesus said, that's my mission, to restore the light, to restore the truth, and to restore what love really is. A new commandment, he says just a few verses later here in John, a new commandment I give to you. Now, he's not saying as though that commandment has never existed, but he's saying, I'm going to demonstrate to you in a new way, a commandment, that you love one another even as I have loved you, and that also you love one that you also love one another. As I have loved you, so also should you love one another. Now, um, again, this is right in line with the great commandment that Jesus was asked about. What is the great command? And Jesus said, it's simple. Love the Lord God with all of, all that you are, your heart, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. This was, this was the key message of Jesus, and he demonstrates his love in every action that he takes in the New Testament. Going right up to the cross, and to the, uh, to the resurrection, and then his continued acts of love as he ascended into heaven. But Jesus makes it clear, this is my command, this is what I'm telling you, this is I want, what I want you to understand. Even the Sermon on the Mount, and, and again, right through the Beatitudes and the, and the uh, comments about the discipleship's relationship to the world and then personal relationships, you've heard that it was said, but I say unto you, this is how he ends the Sermon on the Mount, the most important sermon ever given is the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love. Love. This is, what, this is the bottom line. This is the foundation. This is what you need to know about everything that I have said, every reason that I have come. I say to you, love. Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Now, we, we talk a lot about love in the church, and, 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 and the, the, the culture around us it, you know, talks about love. And, and again, I'm not here to stand up as an expert on all the nuances and everything that's possible to be understood about this uh, uh, most powerful uh, element in the universe is love. But it helps us as we study our New Testament, it helps us in our walk and our relationship with Jesus to remember it in the context that everything He did was to restore the truth about what the love of God is and how God's love should be operational in our lives. So the title of my sermon, I put love with a question mark. And I think the devil has been quite successful in twisting and providing counterfeits and ditches for people to fall into when they are trying to understand what love really is. And there's several, there's several phrases they're not new necessarily. Some of these have been around forever, and we have other ways of saying them. But as I have, you know, watched and interacted with, uh, uh, you know, television and heard people talking and a lot of the things in the news, you hear an, uh, an abundance of these phrases used a lot. Okay, and again, in in a in a in a vacuum, there's nothing wrong with these phrases. There is a way. You know, there's a two sides to every way of looking at a certain fact or situation. Okay, but these phrases are being used to a large degree in a new way in our culture. Be yourself. N nothing wrong with that, right? 
And we've been saying that forever. You know, there's, there's some truth to that. There's, there's some real positive ways of looking at that. Be yourself. But the way in which it's being used today, I think, is problematic. And so just like I was saying earlier, the Jews had the Scriptures, but the way in which they were interpreting those Scriptures was creating darkness. It wasn't that they had the wrong Scriptures. They had the right words. But the way in which they were applying and understanding those words was incorrect. So again, it's not so much the words that we're saying might be problematic, but the way in which they're being used. Follow your heart. How many of you have said that before, thought that before, uh, been blessed by that thought before? Don't be shy. Don't, don't think that I'm going to call you out and say how terrible a person you are. <laughs> okay, not right now at least. No, I'm just kidding. Follow your heart. And again, that's, there's nothing wrong with that about, about you know, knowing what you want and being focused on it and confident and moving forward. There's a way in which that can be a very positive thing. But the way in which our culture largely is interpreting it today is very problematic. Follow your heart. If you happen to fall in love with a married person, that's okay. Follow your heart. They're married, not a problem. Follow your heart. You see what I'm saying? So, uh, historically, there's been boundaries on stains like this, like be yourself. Yes, be yourself. But if you happen to find out that you're a racist, don't be that, right? There were boundaries. There were limitations. Follow your heart, yes. But if your heart leads you to, to some negative side, don't follow that. You know, you do you. That's, that's the one the kids are saying today, Jaylene. The kids, they love it. You do you. As though that's, that thought has never been. I mean, we've been saying live and let live forever, right? To each his own, right? It's the same thing. You know, different strokes for different. Ah, see, you're listening. <laughs> it's, it's, there's nothing new under the sun. It's just this is kind of the, the modern, cool way of, suing it, of, of saying it. You know, I do me and you do you, you know? And it's just a way of saying it's okay to be unique. It's okay to have your own identity. And again, there's no problem with that. But with that, you know, with the words in general, but it's the way they're applied today that I think is very destructive and damaging. You do you. And again, there used to be boundaries. You do you. Yeah, but you still got to pay your taxes. Right? Well, I'm, the way I look at it, the taxes are unjust and unfair and I don't want to do it. So I'm not going to do it. That doesn't work. You do you, but you still got to follow the road signs. You can't drive through the red lights. Okay? And there have always been a kind of a perspective and boundary that have protected us from taking these types of phrases too far or twisting them into ways that actually reverse the meaning of what they are. And again, this one is, is uh, becoming more and more popular today. Love is love. Did you see how I did the heel raise on that to say, love is love. And it's this, it's this uh, kind of empowering idea that you hear a lot in culture. A lot of it has to do with sexual politics and, and a lot of the challenges uh, that people have just saying, whatever kind of love you feel is right for you, then it's right because love is love. And even if that love is, is quite different than you know, what society has generally said is acceptable, even if that love is historically used to be considered kind of uh, perverse or different, it doesn't matter. Love is love. And you can't question it. And so I put a question mark and say, well, I do want to evaluate how does our modern church, how do we as Christians, as believers in Christ, navigate with this large, I think, uh, cultural pressure when it comes to these ideas of self-expression and love and selfishness? So I just want to go take a minute and go through and by the way, I could put 12 other statements up here that say basically the same thing, right? But oh, by the way, back when I was, you know, I'm a child, I was a teenager in the 90s, the big phrase was, what would Jesus do? Any of you remember that era, the what would Jesus do era? You, you wore the little armband, the WWJD, uh, right? What would Jesus do? But then there was, all, I don't know if you know, there was the what did Jesus do? Were any of you, there's a, because people say, we don't need to wonder what he did. We just need to look at what he did do. And so you had these kind of two competing phraseology. So that was kind of my, you know, uh, growing up in the 90s, there was that whole era of what would Jesus do? And it's kind of the same idea of, you know, uh, trying to understand how do we navigate these issues of love and understand what God's plan is in our lives with these different societal messages coming at us. So I just want us to look at these briefly for a minute and just 
just give a biblical perspective. Again, nothing wrong with telling someone to be yourself as far as don't wear masks, don't lie to yourself, don't be afraid, stand for your principles, be courageous. All those things are true. But the way in which be yourself is often shared today has a selfish overtone. Even if being yourself is offensive to those around you, even if being yourself is is, is, is a shattering of, of, of values, that's okay. Just stand for what it is. Be yourself. Don't worry about how it affects anyone else. Now, that idea is not good. As a matter of fact, that is almost exactly the opposite to the love that Jesus was trying to express to us when he came to this earth. The very first beatitude that Jesus teaches us in the Sermon on the Mount is blessed are those who are poor in spirit. It's not blessed are those who are haughty in spirit, those who are, are uh, you know, just, just take their own opinions and say, I don't care how it affects anyone else. The very first beatitude is don't obsess about yourself. Have a poor spirit. Recognize that outside of the spirit of God, you are in poverty. Your spirit is insufficient to have happiness and love in your life. So blessed are those who recognize their need for a greater spirit. That's the first, uh, uh, and again, the, the greatest command is to focus first on the love of God. Love God first, then love your neighbors, and through that process, you will experience love. You've all heard the acronym JOY, right? The, the best pathway to happiness and joy is to follow what Jesus said. Love Jesus first, J, then love others, O, and then yourself. Why? Why? So what does, the, what does Jesus say? Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must be, be himself. It's the direct opposite. You must deny yourself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, again, I, I, I want to uh, uh, continue to, uh, to emphasize that, again, in a vacuum, the idea of being yourself can be quite positive. But the way in which is often produced today amongst our young people and in entertainment and in the news and in politics is it's a very selfish mentality. Be yourself irregardless of others. Be yourself, reach deep down inside yourself, and whatever you find, accept that as your reality and embrace it. But that is a twisting of the reality of the truth of what we need to understand. The beginning process of being a disciple of Jesus Christ is to deny yourself, is to recognize that there is a brokenness in you that is in disrepair, and it will lead you down a pathway that is not happy if you simply embrace it. So you have these things counter them. So now, again, you, you can find passages in the Bible that support the, the idea of, of, again, being transparent, being yourself. I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing this in the way that it's often produced in our society. Be yourself. If you mean it in the way of just embracing whatever you find in yourself and just saying, that's my true self, then that would be counter to what the Bible says. The Bible says that the beginning walk of the disciple of God if you want to be a disciple of God, you must first deny yourself and put others ahead of you. Does that make sense? Primarily God. First and foremost, God. Look at the way people drive today. I, I try to use practical examples. The, most, the majority of people when they drive, are they being themselves or are they denying themselves? Come on. How do you drive? Right? How would Jesus, what would Jesus do? How would Jesus drive if he was on the streets of Phoenix? Right? Deny yourself. Put others first. The twisting of this is detrimental to our understanding of God and our experience with the Holy Spirit. We should first and foremost be blessed if we are poor in spirit and ask that the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and him ch let Him change us. The next one is very similar. And again, there's not a huge distance or line between these. They're all similar. But this idea of follow your heart, uh, the way I'm hearing it used is so dangerous today. 
And again, I used that example earlier. People that will say, well, I just, I've looked deep into my heart and I've just found that I love someone that I'm not supposed to love. But that's what my heart says. And so if my heart says it, I'm going to follow it. They're married, doesn't matter. That's what my heart says. They are of a gender that is similar to mine. Uh, It doesn't matter what the Bible says. That's what my heart says. I'm following my heart. And the danger of this is, 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 is clear. The Bible says, beware of what your heart tells you. Again, the heart's a wonderful thing, and we should love the Lord with all of our heart. In the heart, we, we have our emotions, and we, we, we make decisions, and all these things. Did you know your heart has neurons? Did you know that? Your heart has neurons. Neurons are, are where, where the capacity to think are. Your heart has about 50,000 neurons. Literally, your heart helps you make decisions. The organ, the flesh of your heart is part of the decision-making process of your brain. Did you know that? So when the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so, is, so he is, we used to say, oh, that's just poetic license because we know we don't think in the heart, we think in the brain. Well, we now know that there are about 50,000 neurons in your heart that are part of the thinking process of your brain. By the way, that was for free, a little science bit on the side. Donations can be left in the basket on your way out, though. But the Bible warns, your heart is a broken heart. Outside of the grace of God, outside of the transforming power of God, away from a a reliance on His Spirit, your heart will lead you in all sorts of directions. Your heart will lead you towards all kinds of decisions that are not good, that are not godly, and that are not God's ideal of what love is. So again, follow your heart can be a very wonderful idea and understood in the right context and with the right boundaries and the, and, and the right bookends, follow your heart is a fine uh, way of, if, as long as your heart, if, if the Lord God is on the throne of your heart, then you're listening to God through your heart. Does that make sense? But if you are not depending on his spirit, if you are not inviting his spirit into your heart, and if you're setting him aside and say, whatever's in my heart, I'm going to reach deep down in my heart, and whatever I find, whatever happens to be there, that must be the truth, and I'm going to grasp onto it. That is what the devil is telling our society. That is what many people are doing in their daily decisions about what they do with their life, how they operate, uh, how they interact with their coworkers, their neighbors, their family. It has become a selfish, inward-looking idea. I, well, why didn't you, you know, do this? How come you weren't merciful and just and nice? Well, because my heart told me not to. I followed my heart. Well, we need to be warned that the heart can lead us astray. Far, uh, for from within, out of the heart, Jesus tells us, is where we have all this evil stuff stored up. Just because you find it in your heart doesn't mean it's right. Does that make sense? Just because you look deep into your heart and you find something there doesn't mean that's God's will for your life. By the way, what I'm telling you right now is not popular. That's why this is a sanctuary, that this is a safe place that I can say it. But if you go outside the walls of this church and you say things like this, you're not going to be very popular. Just because you find something in your heart. This is the great equalizer. You find something in your heart, then you go to the scriptures to see whether that measures up with what God's plan and what love truly is. That is God's plan for us. He knows our hearts are twisted. He knows our hearts have been affected by sin. And he's given us the medicine. You find it in your heart, then bring it to Scripture and let Scripture massage it into the right path that it needs to be. But to erase that from your life, to say regardless, irregardless of what Scripture says or what, what you know, I've learned from the Bible, I'm just going to follow my heart. Danger, friends. And it has led so many to this confusing arena of emotions and ideas that now dominate our society and our young people. You do you. This is, I see car commercials that talk about this. 
you know, uh, electric cars and things like that. You do you, you know, get that. And it's this very, you know, in vogue way of saying, I'm going to be independent and I'm not going to worry about it. And again, there's a fine way, uh, again, of embracing the uniqueness and identity and, and ways of saying there is something unique and special about me and I don't want to hide that. And that's fine. But there is a selfish undertone to a lot of the way in which this is now um, expressed in our society. It goes right back to these other ones. Again, not a big distinction between them, but it's just kind of this idea, no matter how it affects others, if it's good for you, go ahead and do it. By the way, this is the libertarian men mentality, which, you know, again, not to be political, but um, um, there's always been these boundaries within the American political sphere of guiding where, where the boundaries of civilization and society are. The libertarian me mentality is if, if, it, if it's okay for you, go ahead and do it. Don't worry how it affects others. And, and forgive me, I'm not... If you happen to be a libertarian and love it, I, I'm not trying to um, uh, uh, undercut that, but I think there's a great danger that, that when you say, look, if you want to do drugs and, 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 and live it up and you're not hurting anyone else, do it. You know, you want to be a prostitute and, and it's consensual and, and no one's being hurt, do it. That is uh, separated from, from the political, the, the libertarian philosophy is that you do you. And again, I think this runs grossly counter to the principles of love that Jesus sacrificed his life to demonstrate for us when he came to the earth. Our world is not about you do what you want to do, I do what I want to do, and, 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 and everything's going to be hunky-dory. We should be compassionate and we should understand that our decisions impact those around us. Even if we isolate ourselves, it was John Doan who said, no man is an island. The SAS John Doan, I think, said, no man is an island. No matter what you do, no matter how much you remove yourself from society and say, well, I'm just going to be uh, doing my own thing and, and it shouldn't affect anyone. No, our decisions do affect those around us. No matter how much we try to remove ourselves. So we need to be careful with this idea, with this drumbeat, with this interpretation of love, that the loving thing to do is just to say, you do you. No matter how it affects those around us. What does Jesus, what does the Bible say? It does say something. And it's beautiful and it's profound. Are we just to do our own thing? Who are we supposed to emulate? Did it crash, guys? 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 is one passage we could look at. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul says, Be imitators of me just as I am of Christ. We are not to do our thing. We're to do Christ's thing. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Okay? As believers in Jesus, as followers of Jesus, we should not have an, an attitude of, I'm just going to do my thing. We don't do, I don't want to do my thing. I want to do God's thing. What does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? If we look at what Christ teaches us and say, well, that's good for you, but I'm going to do me. What's the point of calling yourself a Christian? Now, if you don't want to be a Christian, if you want to, that's fine. But for the community of faith, to the followers of Jesus, we do not believe in you do you. Now, this isn't about coercion and forcing our way onto other people, by the way. That's not what this is about, about us saying, well, you have to do as I do. But as an individual, our decision should not be separated from the society around us. Say, I'm just going to do what I do. As a believer in Jesus Christ, we want to do as Christ does. And how do we learn what Christ does? He has given it to us in His Word. In the beginning, Dennis, was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word itself was God. The other verses, I've given you example, Jesus said, that you should do as I did. That is the true expression of love, to follow the example of Jesus. The last one, love is love. Love is love. Whatever that love is, as long as it's consensual, it's love. That's what our society says. And by the way, even the argument of consensualness is fading. It's fading. 
about how you define consensual love. And I could give you details. Uh, I don't want to get into it today, but we are racing on a freeway towards a disastrous end as a society when it comes to this topic. We are racing there. Love is love. It sounds so accommodating. It feels good. It feels inclusive. But it's a trap. It's a lie. The Bible does not say love is love. The Bible says God is love. God is love. If you want to know what love is, you look at it through the lens of the revealed Word of God. You look at it in Jesus Christ. And if what you think is love does not measure up with the character of God and the message of God in the Scriptures, guess what? It's not love. You can call it other things. It could be lust. It could be uh, pleasure. It could be pride. It can be power. But it's not love. Because the only thing that is love is God. God is the only one able to fully manufacture and and manifest and demonstrate and teach what love really is. And any time we we decline from that, any time we move away from that, we head into the darkness of a society and we see the results of it today. So love is love when it is consistent with God, then it's love. This is, this is the great uh, uh, challenge that we find in our society today and why we have so much confusion over what love is. The further we move as a society away from God, the further we move from relying on His Scripture, the further we move from, from uh, uh, accepting the values that have established so much of the, the uh, stability and foundation of our society, the quicker we get to a world beyond repair. And for us as a community of faith, we need to be sticking close to Jesus and letting His mission of love tell us how to interpret these things. And again, the, the, we don't have a lot of young people here, but this is the challenge more for our young people today than it is for the not so young. Because they are getting hit with these messages over and over. And you're not allowed to question it. You're not allowed to debate it. And so as we can be good examples in this, and as we can lead our church, lead our families, lead our homes, lead our schools, lead our neighborhoods, in a better way of understanding the principles of God's love. His mission was a mission of love. What is love? John seemed to be somewhat obsessed with this idea, of, uh, both in his gospel and his epistles. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. All those phrases that I went through very briefly, they all have a selfish kind of focus. You be you, be yourself, follow your heart. Love is whatever you want love to be. They're all very selfish in the way in which they're often thought about today. And true love is the opposite of that. By this, the love of God was manifested, that God sent Jesus. He sent Jesus to us that we might have life. He put the priority outside of himself. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the sacrifice or propitiation for our sins. If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So as we continue on our journey, make His revelation your foundation. Make His mission your mission. Read through the New Testament looking at it through the context of it being a mission of love. Everything he teaches, what am I supposed to learn about love? Every parable, every miracle, every sermon, he's teaching us love. We need that because we're getting pressured so hard on the other side with a message that is quite dark. So as we close, would you stand with us?